back. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a great opportunity to get the word out there on certain uh, chronic conditions and certainly how gut health can play an integral part in that. Um, I got sick about nine years ago. Um, I just moved to Savannah, Georgia to start my medical residency. I just finished two years of cervical residency. And I was in <clears throat> Savannah for about three months and I moved into an apartment there, started my residency and developed uh, a really bad zoster, shingles infection on my left flank. And um, I didn't think much of it at the time. I was stressed being a resident. Um, uh, talked to some, some ID doctors. They said, yeah, probably from the stress, no need to concern yourself. So I went about my daily residence routine and, um, and about a month later or so, three weeks later, traveling with my family, developed a uh, left arm numbness. And I knew enough about uh, neurological pathophysiology that, that uh, numbness or weakness on one side of the body or the other, unless you've got a carpal tunnel or something simple like that, usually is not a great thing. I wasn't a, a stroke candidate. I didn't have any risk factors for stroke. So I was obviously concerned about this. Um, uh, that night, I had some urinary frequency and some, uh, my whole body felt like it was um, um, being electrocuted. It was a very uneasy feeling. So I knew something neurological was going on. Um, I was aware of my previous shingles infection, but I didn't really connect the two at the time. So got back into town, had a battery of testing done, um, uh, initial MRI of the cervical spine and uh, CSF analysis revealed a likely diagnosis of initially they thought MS. And uh, so this was disconcerting to me as a, a, a newly initiated medical resident. Um, went to go see uh, one of the leading MS specialists at the Mayo Clinic. Um, she uh, found it interesting that I had a previous shingles infection. She linked the two events together and she said, keep an eye on it, go back to Savannah. Keep an eye on this. If it, if it happens again, it's going to probably be MS. So again, uh, more more disappointing news and, and certainly stressful news. Um, as as time progressed, um, and, and and all the while, I, I just didn't feel right in my apartment. I never felt really great in terms of a health from a health standpoint. Um, didn't feel all that great at work either. Again, could be stress. Who knows at this point. As time progressed, the, the symptoms became more systemic um, in that the neuropathy um, was more stocking glove distribution. It was, it was symmetrical. I had a lot of brain fog, trouble concentrating, um, uh, things of this nature. Um, an interesting thing developed during this time, shortly after all this, um, within a few weeks, I, I developed some worsening GI, some, some diarrhea, some weight loss, but interesting, I had developed a puritic rash on my right leg. So here we are now into this thing, just a few months. I've had an infectious disease um, diagnosis. I've had a possible neurologic diagnosis. Now I have a dermatological manifestation. Uh, that was biopsied and, and shown to be uh, dermatitis repetiformis, which you may or may not know is pathognomonic or pre-specific for a, a, a celiac or a gluten uh, exposure of some sort with deposition of antibodies in the, in the biopsy um, um, uh, result. So that was interesting to me. So how I, now I have three different kind of zebras. I call them zebras because they were, you know, for an otherwise healthy 40-year-old man is pretty rare. Um, uh, so that was interesting. So more time went on, um, struggling at work because of brain fog, wasn't thinking clearly. Um, um, and uh, the neuropathy persisted. I certainly felt worse with certain types of foods. I, I made that connection when I had the rash. Um, I finished residency. I, I, I made it through residency. Uh, first job out of residency was in Austin, Texas. Moved to Austin. Felt a little bit better. I knew I had to avoid gluten. I wasn't exactly sure why, um, uh, but felt a little bit better. Wanted some supplementation and some, some dietary changes. Gained the weight back, um, and, um, but still sometimes didn't feel great at work. Um, and I, I began to kind of make a connection there um, as time went on. 
um, made a, get a promotion, moved to Houston, Texas, to Houston Methodist, which is an older hospital. And it wasn't made clear to me until after I moved there and started going to work that every time I'd go into a certain building, one of the older buildings there in, in the hospital, I would get really, really uh, sick. I wouldn't feel good. I'd get dizzy. Almost, it's almost a feeling of being either drunk or, or hypoglycemic. Um, and about two hours after leaving work, I'd feel a bit better. Uh, exercise would, would make it better. Steam room makes it better. Um, certain things make it better. Certain things make, made it worse. But certainly being at work made it worse. And I happened to run into a gentleman who, um, a pediatric neuropsychiatrist, um, who is one of the leading um, uh, folks in PANDAS, which is a pediatric autoimmune encephalitis related to uh, a staph previous, um, excuse me, strep infection. And he told me, he said, listen, you're getting sick from exposure. Um, you probably got sick when you moved into your apartment in Savannah. Later, I found out that that particular unit I was in had significant mold and water damage. Now, being in Savannah, one of the most humid places on earth, uh, right next to Houston, um, um, certainly is your cult you can be a, you can be a candidate for for water damage and mold certainly um, so he said you probably got sick there um, not only was your immune system taxed you probably caused some damage to the gut lining because not only do you breathe in the spores or the mycotoxins you also ingest those mycotoxins people don't realize that they they think you know allergies um, are, are just breathe into the respiratory tract, but you swallow a lot of those allergens and a lot of those toxins as well. Um, um, and that produced just this cascading of, of uh, symptomatic events that led to, now, whether the, the zoster being a, um, uh, a neurotrophic um, enterovirus had any play in all this, being most of my symptoms were, symptoms were neurologic, I'm not sure. And again, a lot of this is theory and the problems with chronic illness is it's hard to prove a lot of it and it's hard to disprove a lot of it. I see patients all the time in the hospital who are admitted for acute, you know, ailments, you know, they need a stent, throw them back to me for a, for an acute stroke. We can do those things really well, but when it comes to someone saying, oh, well, I've had, you know, tingling in my legs for six months, we just we don't have a lot to offer. Some of the best neurologists that I've ever worked with are here in Houston and they run for the hills when they hear about peripheral neuropathy because there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, unless you're, you know, say B12 deficient or something else going on, or if it's, if it's chemotherapy or something like that. But that being said, I finally started to put the pieces together and why I want to get the, my story out there is, is this because if I hadn't had the medical knowledge that I ha that I have, I would have accepted the diagnoses of multiple sclerosis and just started taking a biologic probably. And some of those biologics, the the side effects are worse than the than the, than the disease itself. Um, but I had enough wherewithal to know that for me to have three or four different things going on at once, three or four zebras happening at once. It just didn't make sense. Um, and I want to educate the public on if you're faced with chronic illness and chronic disease, um, the way we're trained in allopathic medicine is we see symptoms through anchoring heuristics. Sometimes we go towards a certain diagnosis. I mean, we have these little pathways that we go to, not unlike a computer uh, system that we go directly here, directly here, based on symptomology and, and, and past medical history and, and disease progression. But if the, if the diagnosis doesn't fit, I, I don't want people to just accept that. Um, and I know it's easy for me to say, having the medical knowledge um, that we have as physicians, but um, I guess don't always get other people to look into this, people who look outside the box, you know, and that's kind of what I'd like to do uh, in my career going forward, having this happen to me, um, I'd like to help people who are struggling with chronic ailments. Uh, example, I've got my sister's good friend from high school, had been struggling with chronic um, 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 complaints for the last three or four years to a point where she's been completely debilitated. She's not working anymore. 
And, um, and now she's, you know, she's figured out because I've spoken with her about some of these things that, you know, maybe it's some exposures that she's had. Uh, she'd been treated for chronic Lyme disease, which if you talk to infectious disease folks, you know, some of those guys and, and ladies, those physicians don't even think that that exists. Um, but she was taking 30 different medications. Uh, here she is a, you know, in her early 30s, no past medical history, and um, she's taking 30 medications. I said, listen, let's take a step back and see, you know, do you feel better in certain situations, certain environments? You know, and, well, yeah, I do. I, I feel better when I'm not around this area. And I said, well, let's, so they, they ended up doing some things to the house and moving out, moving some things around and doing some, um, some serious work. And she's, you know, now she's, she's on the road to recovery. So those types of stories are really fantastic. And, and I guess with my story, um, you know, gut health, and that's how you and I met Dr. Cormack is integral in all this. Um, uh, the term leaky gut uh, certainly isn't in the mainstream uh, medical jargon as of yet. Um, it's getting there. Thank goodness Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic and places that are a little bit uh, more alternative in their, in their ways of thinking and more open-minded to some certain things have opened up to this functional medicine um, ideology and practice. Um, and it's not an ideology. It's, it's a true practice and it's something that's really coming up and becoming a lot more um, respected in the medical community um, to look outside the box. And, and, and so if your gut is unhealthy and you've got dysbiosis and you've got gut damage and inflammation, um, uh, the leaky gut um, um, idea is that if if those macromolecules that you ingest, the, the gut does a really good job of, of resorbing what it needs, nutrients, amino acids, things that it can use to sustain. Um, if you're leaking macromolecules or larger proteins that the immune system's never seen before, um, you can imagine this would produce a cascade and, and an explosion of an immune response that is abnormal. And, and from that, you could deduce that you could have molecular mimicry. In other words, if you had a viral infection, um, say, for instance, you came down with the flu, or in my case, I had, you know, the, the zoster infection. And if you had this overwhelming immune response that was abnormal going on in the gut, could you not have your immune system become confused and certainly start attacking itself? I mean, it makes perfect sense to me, um, hard to prove, uh, and that's kind of where we run into, in, into some problems in, in the traditional medical community is we want data. We need data. My friends get on me for, for always wanting data, but that's just how we practice. Um, there is an interesting test called a GI map, and this is kind of where Dr. Carmack um, and her work has come in. I had my GI map done, and there's a, there's a protein called zonulin. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with zonulin. It's a protein that's found within the tight junctions, mainly in the small intestine um, of the GI system. And it's outside of the lumen. So in other words, it's not inside the, the, the GI tract. It's just outside, but it's, it holds those tight junctions together and keeps that gut um, impermeable, uh, keeps it tight, so to speak. Uh, zonulin is um, it's shown to be activated by certain things. Gliadin is one. is a protein that's found in wheat and, and uh, gluten. And that can uh, overstimulate zonulin and make the gut more permeable. There's a great test, the GI mapping test, that, that will measure your zonulin in the stool. Now, your zonulin, sh again, should not be in the stool because it's not intraluminal. It's outside the lumen. So if it's in the stool, that means that you have gut permeability issues. And mine was elevated. Um, no, no shock there. Also had some other things. Klebsiella was high. That's an autoimmune marker. Um, some of my um, prebiotics were low and my IgA was low. All of these things are certainly indicative of a leaky gut type syndrome. 
And that's kind of the working diagnosis now is, is that I moved into the apartment. Um, I ingested these spores. Um, um, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the, did the gut damage happen first or did the immune respond? It's hard to say really, it's impossible to prove. Um, long story short, there was a dysbiosis, a leaky gut syndrome um, um, with the su subsequent viral infections, you know, uh, chronic uh, high levels of EBV uh, antibodies, hard to say what that's all about. But healing the gut is integral. And if you get to the root of the problem, you can fix everything. That said, I had repeat labs done. My natural killer cells in my immune system, my IgG subtype 1 and 3 were both low. And that explains these chronic enteroviral infections. I had those, uh, those labs done before and after my gut therapy. Before they were all low, showing a, a depleted immune system, specifically in the IgG subclass one and three, and also the IgA, and the natural killer cells, which are, if you, I'm sure we all know this, that up to 75% of your immune system is located in your small bowel. So um, afterwards, had some repeat labs done, all my immune markers were normal. Natural killer cell, cells back to normal range, my subclass IgG were back normal, one and three were back normal. My secretory IgA were back in normal range. And that was just from healing the gut. Uh, my viral infections absolved, um, feeling much better, trying to avoid the, that building in the hospital as much as I can. Um, but really it all starts, Dr. Carmack, with genetics. Um, if you're pre, disposed not to be able to um, um, uh, detoxify these toxins, you know, you're predisposed to what I have gone through. And that's a whole different discussion. Uh, HLA, you know, DQ, all that kind of fancy stuff. That being said, if you don't have those genetics, you can walk into a water damaged moldy building or whatever your exposures are and be fine. Uh, if you're like me, um, your glutathione pathways are kind of screwy and you just can't manufacture and detoxify those, those chemicals and those exposures. So it builds up, it builds up, it builds up. Your, your body pays the price. Your immune system is overtaxed. Um, you get breakdown in, you know, you know, Eastern medicine doctors believe the gut is the center of the being. Um, Western medicine thinks it's up here. I'm starting to believe more of the Eastern medicine folks and uh, um, once you get breakdown and, and dysbiosis and, and uh, disharmony down there I think you can suffer your whole body can certainly suffer and, and that I think my story is a perfect example of that um, you know and so um, that's kind of how and, and with the with the microbiome labs um, <clears throat> I started using the powders the the gut repair powder Lots of glutamine. Glutamine has been shown lots of studies to, sh to heal and gut repair. Um, and uh, and Dr. Carm uh, Dr. Carmack can expand more on the ingredients and some of those gut repair and prebiotic um, formulations. But now I've, she's gotten me to take the uh, Megaspore, which has been fantastic. And I can tell you, in the, in the course of this illness that I've gone through, um, symptoms always come on the same. If I eat something I shouldn't be eating, um, I always get the neurologic symptoms first. Uh, I still get some tingling in the feet. And I, the, my main thing is the brain fog. Um, and then about two or three days later, the diarrhea and the, the GI symptoms come on. It's very predictable. So it's, this is, there are no coincidences in medicine. I always tell my patients, you know, if you, if you have sinus surgery and then you develop meningitis, you don't have two separate things going on. The two are related. And in my case, I knew I didn't have, you know, um, shingles uh, and MS and dermatitis herpetiformis all at the same time. It's like getting a stroke on both sides of the brain at the same time and then having symmetrical symptoms. It just doesn't happen that way in medicine. And that's, we can say that with certainty because there'd be case studies on it and there aren't. And um, so... So for me, it was obvious that there was a big, instead of hearing the zebras running, I always make this analogy, I'm sorry to keep going, going back to it, but 
I knew it was one big horse. I knew that it was one big horse that was causing all of my issues. And if you're a person without medical training, you don't, you don't know that necessarily. And you just accept whatever the doctors, whatever we tell you, because we're the experts and we're telling you, you know, you've got MS and you know, this is going to be a, this is going to be a life changing diagnosis for you. And, and that's kind of what I went through. I said, well, I, I have enough knowledge to know that the, it just doesn't make sense. So ask the questions, you know, look at the root cause of the issue. And that's where microbiome labs comes in. I mean, uh, for me, it's been, um, along with some, uh, my herbalist in, in Jacksonville, who my good friend um, got me in, um, in contact with, um, he's been played an integral part too. And herbs are a whole different scenario and with, you know, proprietary blends and things like that and and it gets very complicated but certainly we can simplify it by saying how do we heal the gut if you're having chronic you know because we don't know what causes chronic illness we don't know what causes rheumatoid arthritis ms you know um, psoriatic issues lupus systemic lupus erythematosus we don't know what causes these things we have theories okay well is it a viral cause we, we just don't know and if you go to a rheumatologist or a neurologist or someone and ask them they're not going to tell you the cause. What if, you know, Dr. Carmack, I'm, I'm posing this question to you. What if, you know, the answers are in the gut? I mean, what if the answers are, if, if you've got, you know, crazy things going on down there, a dysbiosis, if you've got leaky gut, if you've got um, autoimmune triggers, I mean, can that produce a molecular mimicry type of scenario where your body just gets confused, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, your body gets confused and for, forgets what it's supposed to do. And I can also tell you this, interestingly enough, when I felt my best clinically, when I, when my symptoms were the, the, the least, and I felt like myself again, are the times that I came up with an acute infection, like the flu, the few, the few times I've had the flu in these last nine years, sure. I felt feverish and I felt body aches from the flu, but my symptoms, my foggy brain, my neuropathy, my other symptoms that were really, really the mainstay of my illness were gone. And that tells me, well, okay, the immune system must have sent, oh, pushed a reset button. This is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be fighting the flu virus instead of, you know, um, Dr. Britton's own cells, old own tissues. So, Again, another good indication of molecular mimicry, but it's hard to prove, impossible to prove. You have to just go by clinical improvement and um, these GI mapping tests are fantastic um, to really kind of gauge, you know, what's growing in your gut, um, what's healing in your gut. So I think, you know, we have some fantastic tools out there. Genetic testing is another one that I would start with to see if you're even um, gonna be uh, a candidate for um, potential exposure problems. Um, but certainly there's, there's tools out there now that we can use to really help us find the root of the problem. And that's kind of where I come in. I want to find out what's causing it, not just treat the symptoms. Mm -hmm. I see neurologic patients come in the hospital all the time with, with these types of things. And we have a couple things to offer steroids <laughs> and IVIG and which are, which are uh, manufactured antibodies. And they may give you temporary relief, possibly, but we're just scraping the surface. We're scraping mm -hmm. the surface of these symptoms and we're not doing anything. Let, let's, let's find out what's, what's down here at the bottom of the pyramid so we can, you know, have it all come down, so to speak. And, and you know, and, and that's kind of uh, where I've come into to the gut health um, um, arena and just said, listen, this is where it starts. And, um, you can't get better until you get that uh, fixed. Right. Dr. Britton, thank you so much because your story is so important. There have been about five of my practitioners that I've been talking with that have mold exposure toxicity and they're suffering. And if it's happening within our, our doctors and our practitioners, you can just imagine how many individuals have no idea what's happening to them. No idea. Now, I did have a question. Um, I was happened to be at a lecture in Houston, 
and they were talking about a Dr. Schumacher, um, the Marcona, uh, Marcone's test on biofilm right. and um, the cholesteramine. Have you looked into that? Is there anything to that? Absolutely. The, the cholesteramine is an old GI um, uh, anti-diarrheal drug, actually, but it's a binding agent. And it's, it's, there's numerous studies that show that it binds these mycotoxins. And, of course, it has to bind mostly the ones in your, in your gut, but it also gets in, in the bloodstream and can bind um, mycotoxins in the bloodstream as well. And um, you end up, usually end up urinating those out, and the ones in the stool you usually have with bowel movements, and those, that's how the toxins get released. It keeps, it's good at keeping the toxin levels lower. Um, there's not, there's not great um, uh, brain barrier, um, uh, blood brain barrier penetration, but certainly if you can, it's almost like giving someone heparin or, or blood thinners if they have a pulmonary embolism. You're not, you're not involving the clot, you're simply preventing more clot from forming. So it's kind of analogous to that. You're, 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 you're taking away the, you're, you're taking away the, um, uh, the, uh, the mycotoxin load, so to speak, and you're you're binding those mycotoxins toxins and eliminating them with the cholestyrin. The Marcan's test, um, I had that done, and I did uh, test positive for that, and I ended up taking a um, doing an antibiotic spray. I think the biofilms and the nasal passages. I'm certainly at risk for that. I've had two uh, nasal surgeries. One was correct, corrective surgery after. Uh, after a football uh, uh, injury in, in, in high school, just before high school, so I had a rhinoplasty, and I had a then I had a, um, a septoplasty afterwards to correct the septum. So certainly, I'm at an increased risk of having um, uh, biofilms in the nasal passage. Um, I'm not exactly sure what benefit that has that test had in my recovery. Um, I, I took the treatment, I took the antibiotic spray, and certainly nasal washings are important. Uh, but with me being in a hospital, I mean, I'm inundated with, with staff uh, in the nasal passages. Um, yeah, I, I took off the muting, um, and so I think someone has some background noise, but I, I wanted to unmute people so that they could ask other questions. So sure. if you don't have a question, do you please mute yourself out there? But if you do have a question, um, uh, please go ahead. And I'm sorry to interrupt. I just know that there was background. Sure. sure. Does anyone have I, any questions out there? I have a quick question. Um, sure. Where did the microbiome lab uh, supplements or the probiotics come in in terms of the time frame of your healing process? Very, very late in the game. Very late in the game. Not until I got out here to Houston, Texas. Um, you know, f for me, it was the avoidance of gluten that really uh, helped. Because if you think about it, if you don't take away the, the trigger, uh, it will be impossible to heal your gut. Impossible. You could take all the spores and, and pro and prebiotics and aloe vera, licorice, glutamine in, in the world. And if you don't take away the trigger, and I talked about gliadin being the main trigger for this zonulin activation, um, it's going to be impossible to heal at all. So for me, it was the avoidance of gluten, which I'm you know, sometimes I cheat, a lot of times I cheat, and I pay the price, but I know that that's the trigger for me. Uh, sugars, you know, uh, certain types of uh, color dyes, red dye, green dye, and certain um, candies and foods and things like that, those are the triggers for me that make me feel really, really bad, and if you don't take those away, it's impossible, even with the, all the supplements that are out there, to heal. So for me, it was late in the game. Um, uh, I had started taking my herbal, um, um, my herb, herbalist in Jacksonville sends me these dry herbs in the mail. I cook them down to, to 10 ounces. I drink five ounces in the morning, five ounces of the broth at night. I've been doing that for about a year now. Um, that was first. And once I saw an improvement in that, my stools became normal. Um, every time I talked to my herbalist, he only had, every time I would mention a symptom, he'd say, Adam, listen, stop, stop. I don't want to hear your symptoms. I know what's going on with you. Tell me what your stool looks like. Tell me what it, you know, is, is there undigested food in the stool? He would have very specific, he knew what he was looking for. And, and he was right. I mean, and, and so 
he sends me herbs every two weeks. And I, I, I do that recipe. And it wasn't until I talked to Dr. Carmack and other folks about you really need to supplement the gut lining with glutamine, you know, with, I, I knew from the GI mapping that I was deficient in a very important prebiotic, which is imperative for the probiotics to work properly. So um, I found a, a supplement that had uh, high levels of that prebiotic from Dr. Carmack's group. I was taking that powder in the morning, and then she introduced me to the Megaspore, and with, which has a number of different uh, bacillus species, and she can expand on that more if she wants. But um, so it was late in the game. It was late in the game. And, and I certainly since then have seen even more of an improvement. So the fact that I was sick for so long, and it's an excellent question, by the way, sick for so long, it's going to take, you know, who knows how long to, to fix. And, and I can tell you that I'm, I'm almost completely there just after, you know, a year or so of pretty aggressive uh, treatment. Um, so. We had a question in the chat. It was about binders. Um, you know, how did you use binders or do you think binders uh, like uh, GI detox or charcoal? I'll, I'll answer from what I've answered that question in the past is um, charcoal is a very non-specific binder and it tends to also soak up the good nutrients. So when you take it is very important. Of course, if you've got food poisoning, there's, there's definitely a role. We have the IgG2000, which is an immunoglobulin, which is a very specific type of binder that helps neutralize the lipopolysaccharide, the viruses and parasites. Um, so that's generally what I recommend. Did you have any experience with using binders? Uh, the cholestyramine is the only one I used, and I used it uh, religiously um, um, once I realized that the, the mycotoxins were probably what was making me sick. I've kind of weaned off the binders um, because I, I feel like with the healing of the gut, um, the gut and the immune system and the, the functions of the gut that we don't even know about, uh, that, that, that the general population is not aware of, does its job. <laughs> and I don't feel like, you know, you need the binders as much. Um, I, I certainly think binders would be good for maintenance. Uh, I would see the, you know, once you, because you're always going to ingest and breathe in toxins. I mean, you walk outside, you go into a building, you can't avoid that. You know, I say avoiding triggers. You can't really avoid triggers. I mean, you have to live your life. Um, so I think cholestyramine would be a good choice, you know, um, doing it a few times a week, maybe just, just for maintenance um, to get rid of that toxin load, I think. Um, now, if you're acutely ill and you feel like, you know, you're, you're certainly um, going the wrong direction clinically, it wouldn't hurt to do, mix it in with some orange juice and do that twice a day, um, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm a believer. I've seen, the to I've seen it work. Also, if you take those, if you take the cholestyramine and you look at your stool, it, you can see the specs of binding. I mean, it, it actually, you can see in the stool the binding speckles of the drug itself. So you know that it's, it's binding something, probably fat soluble and, and um, incorporating itself into the stool. So you can see it work. I mean, um, and you do feel better, um, but it's, it, it's like, it's like steroids. It's, it's just kind of a, a temporary thing unless you're doing it for a, a maintenance um, type situation. So I'm not doing it now because I'm feeling so much better and, and, but I've got boxes of it upstairs. Mm -hmm. so if, anyone, if anyone needs any, I have, I have, you know, tens of thousands of packages of it, but, um, but I think it's, 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 it's well tested. It's well documented. It's, it's in the literature. Um, it works. Um, that's kind of its function as a, as a medication. It's prescription only. So, um, but it's a pretty easy prescription to get. So, um, that's my experience with the cholestyramine. And we launched a product, Wheat Rescue, that is an enzyme to, do, to digest or break down the gluten and gliadin so that it won't be inflammatory in the gut. Um, I don't know if you knew that. I don't even tried those type of enzymes that, especially for hidden gluten, where you're trying to avoid it, but there's products you don't even know that it's in. You know, I haven't tried those, and I, and I, I was tempted to, but then I, I said, well, if I do that, I've trained myself to try and eat 
well to a certain degree and avoid these things, if I take these supplements, that's going to pull me back into bad habits. And that's kind of, I'm kind of OCD like that. I, if, if I, I get very, um, uh, regimented and, um, and, uh, so once I get to something, I like to stick to it. And if I felt, if I started taking those and, and was able to eat bread again and, and pizza and things like that, that I love, then I'd kind of fall back into a bad habit. And I, I want to try to avoid that. But I, I think that those have gotten a lot of good press and, and there's a lot of good results from those, um, those, uh, uh types of medication. So very promising f to folks who don't want to give up um, those types of foods and want to rescue, so to speak, their, their resultant um, symptoms after they, they ingest. Yeah. And I think that's where it, practitioners have to position it correctly. It's not so you eat those foods. It's when you're trying to avoid all gluten, but you just don't know if you eat out, if they're sneaking gluten into things. Well, they're not doing it. I can assure you they're not doing it intentionally, but certainly it's hard to avoid it. You've got contamination. If you're very sensitive, you know, if someone's cutting bread on the same board that they're cutting your, you know, your caprice, I mean, you're going to, you're going to feel it the next day. So, you know, um, that being said, it's impossible to avoid gluten unless you go to a gluten free you know restaurant that specifically uh caters to to that and those are usually the celiac um folks who have to go there because they really have to maintain strict adherence to the anti-gluten uh, diet um so let's see anyone else from the audience have a question for dr Britton? Sounds like everyone is shy today. Everyone's shy. I, I can get a hold of Dr. Britton. If you think of a question, I can email it to him and, and we can keep the conversation going. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to speak with anyone about, about this. You can always visit my website, Adam Britton MD, uh, anytime. It, it shares my story and some of my um, um, information there and you can get, get on the email list or whatnot. But um, you know, it's been a pleasure talking to you, uh, Tracy, and I really appreciate the opportunity. I hope we can do it again. I think the more people that we reach um, concerning this this topic, the better, because, you know, people are sick, and it's affecting their lives. And I can tell you um, um, uh, intimately that, that it, 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 I was put on probation in, in my residency because I was so sick. I mean, I was, I almost lost my career because of this. And you know, it took me eight years to get into medical school. I had to work a little extra harder than the next guy, you know, ended up doing very well. But right when I got into my working stage of my career is when I got sick and I almost lost it all. Mm -hmm. And for me, it makes it, uh, I appreciate it more, but it also makes me want to help the people that are struggling, that, are, that, are, that have lost their jobs, that have, you know, their relationships are struggling or, 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 or failing because they're sick. You can't live your life if you're sick. Right. You know, right. you can have all the money in the world. You have all the, all the things in the world you could ever need. But if you're sick, it, nothing matters. And you can't, right. I, I, I'll get to the point where I become so numb to everything. You know, I had patients that were sick and passing away in a hospital. And I was just in la la land because I, I wasn't feeling well. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't do the things I needed to do at work the right way. And it was affecting me. It was affecting my personal life, my professional life. Um, every part of my life was affected because of this. And that was, that's what makes me so passionate about helping people that are struggling because there's got to be a root cause. Yes. Dina's raising her hand. Go ahead, Dina. No. I see, I, saw I, hand. I see, I saw Dina earlier, but she disappeared. Uh, maybe she's yeah. stepped away, but. Well, most of my audience also know, you know, my, my husband's struggling with um, a squamous cell carcinoma, but there's a lot of evidence to link cancer with fungus, with mold. So I think there's a lot yet to discover about um, you know, all these connections and our medical system is not equipped for it. Well, and unfortunately, um, and I'm going to say this and, and, and it could get me in trouble, but there's no money in a cure. And, and, you know, if, 
if you're, if you're going to have studies, if you're going to have medical science research and publications and literature on these things, there's got to be money behind it. And, um, and there's not a lot of labs that want to do research on, on uh, fungal relationships to cancer or EBV relations to lymphoma or, you know, because there's just, there's not a lot of backing for things like that, unfortunately. And I wish there was, but, but that enables us to let's, let's look outside the box like we're doing and, and see if we can find a more, I mean, there's a reason the cavemen were so healthy. I mean, they died when they were 30 because they either got eaten or they died of sepsis from a, you know, from an infection. Um, but their hearts were healthy. They didn't have MS. They didn't have cancer. They didn't have rheumatoid arthritis. And look at their diets. Look at their lifestyle. If, if, if you couldn't kill it or grow it, you just didn't eat it. Um, and, um, you know, I think let's take a few giant steps back and, and, and ask ourselves, well, how has the medical um, um, symposium changed over the years in terms of the kind of diseases that we're faced with? Well, you know, that it's really, really changed. And, you know, hormonal, I mean, excuse me, genetic manipulation of the wheat is mm -hmm. a big part of it. And more people now are sensitive to these dietary things that are out there. And who knows what it's doing to your GI system? Well, we know. I mean, we do know. Um, so let's get, the, let's get the word out there that, that, you know, let's look deeper into the problem and see if we can come up with a solution that doesn't involve, you know, cytotoxic or, 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 or neurotoxic drugs or, you know, um, things that we can certainly, I want to preface that by saying I'm a medical doctor first and foremost. And mm -hmm. I, I certainly endorse medical treatments with pharmacological medications when indicated. I have mm -hmm. to put that disclaimer out there. But mm -hmm. if, if you come to me and you say you've been struggling for years with these ailments, you know, let's try something different. I mean, you know, I don't want to make you sicker with pharmacokinetics. Let's, let's see if we can put it in reverse and, and, and get to the root of the problem. Yeah. Wonderful. So. Super. Well, I'll give one final opportunity if someone wants to break in there. Okay. If not, then I just want again to thank you so much for telling us your story, for availing yourself to finding the answers, the causes, and do hard work, which is really what that route entails uh, to find the answers to the questions. So thank you. Thank everyone for joining us. I will send out the recording so you can send it to your friends. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Carmack. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.